Hello students, welcome to lecture 28 of the online course on nanophotonics, plasmonics and metamaterials. Today's lecture will be on matter surfaces and frequency selective surfaces. So, here is the lecture outline, we will look into the basics of uh, matter surfaces, their application towards phase modulation and some other applications and then we will move on to frequency selective surfaces, we will see their definition, we will look into the fundamentals and also discuss their applications. So, matter surfaces when it comes to mind, it is basically a two dimensional matter material with sub wavelength periodicity and this matter surfaces are able to demonstrate unusual electromagnetic properties and it can vary over a frequency range from microwave to terahertz to optical. They there are resonating matter materials which can be tailored by tuning the geometry of its unit cells or matter atoms. So, conventionally they are used for phase change and focusing of electromagnetic waves at optical frequency in the far field region. So, here is an illustration of uh, typical matter surface. So, you see it is a very thin, it is a basically 2D material with all these unit cells which are basically working on the phase of this incident terahertz wave. It can be terahertz, microwave or optical depending on the frequency range you are looking at. But what it can do, it can modulate the phase or the amplitude or the polarization. Okay. So, that way you can actually get polarization, modulation, special beams, active control, focusing, hologram. Okay. All these different things can be generated by using matter surfaces. So, a formal definition for matter surface is basically an ultra thin array of sub wavelength scale metallic elements which are deposited in periodic, aperiodic or random patterns on the surface of a dielectric substrate and the shapes of the individual elements and their geometry of the layout on the surface, they endow the matter surfaces with distinctive optical properties. And if you think of the origin of these spatial effects that comes from the matter surfaces, they are basically a consequence of coupling of light and the surface plasma propagation waves that generate at the metal dielectric boundary. So, today we will look at a comparison of matter surface with matter materials. So, if you remember matter materials, they are basically 3D materials which are able to provide artificial permeability and permittivity. So, if you remember the split ring resonator array positioned on a metallic wire that was able to give you negative permittivity as well as ne negative permeability. So, what we do, we can actually model the system as an effective permeability mu effective or epsilon effective. So, this is typically a 3D version okay? that is the periodic cells sorry the unit cells are repeated in periodic fashion in all three dimensions. Okay? On the other hand you can think of matter surface which is basically a 2D version. So, here the periodic arrangement of unit cell happens in two lateral dimension, the thickness is very you know little. So, how it can help? So, it can actually change the amplitude, frequency, polarization or phase of the incident wave. So, here is an example say if right circularly polarized light falls on the matter surface, it may give you a left circularly polarized light. Okay? You can also think of you know left circularly polarized light falling and some part of it getting reflected. So, it is blocking the left circularly polarized light to go through. Okay? So, this kind of applications may be possible. So, let us look into the basics of how phase modulation can be obtained through matter surfaces. So, let us assume a wave that is traveling along the z direction as shown in the figure. Okay. And on the transmission through a dielectric plate of fixed thickness that is D okay. and graded 
refractive index. So, the refractive index is given as n x y. So, it is in the x y plane. Okay. So, this is z direction. Okay. So, the x y plane is basically the vertical plane. Okay. And in that case, the wave will undergo a specially varying phase shift, which modified its wave front. So, you can write the phase shift phi x y as n x y k naught d. So, here you can see this is the free space wavelength as soon as it enters a medium with a um, you know refractive index say n x y. So, the wavelengths get shorter. Okay. So, you can see the periodic the wave looks compressed when it comes out it again retains the same kind of wavelength okay, in vacuum. So, here the variation is in x y plane you are seeing this this is the z direction. Okay. So, this is how it changes. Now, achieving a phase shift of 2 pi requires a local thickness which is equivalent to the wavelength of the light in that medium. So, that is how you can actually get a phase shift of 2 pi, right. So, d has to be equal to lambda in that particular medium. Now, a planar matter surface has the merit that it can introduce a phase shift of similar magnitude with far less thickness and this is where things become interesting. That the same amount of phase shift can now be achieved using matter surface instead of using this uh, dielectric plate. You can use a very very thin matter surface which is only couple of nanometers thin okay? and still you can get you know a similar kind of effect. Normally lambda in optics it is like in micrometers okay? orders of micrometers you can think of. Okay? So, if you think of telecommunication wavelength it is 1.55 micron. So, in that case to achieve uh, 2 pi phase shift you will require lambda thickness of uh, this material. Okay. So, that is typically you know 1.55 divided by n that will be the lambda in this particular case, but that is still also in micrometer range. But matter surface can help you achieve that with a nanometer scale thickness. Now, what is the magic in this matter surface? So, the metallic elements that you see in the matter surface that function much like optical antennas which can modify the optical wave fronts. So, when you think of resonant antennas they act as scatterers and they can introduce a frequency dependent phase shift which can range from minus pi to pi for the frequencies below and above resonance. So, a specially varying phase shift like phi x y may be implemented by making use of a matter surface which comprises elements of specially graded size because along x and y there is a variation in the phase shift. So, the elements need not be same along x and y you have to change their size and geometry so that you are able to get specially varying resonance frequencies. I will explain this with example very soon. So, an incoming wave of fixed frequency is then subjected to this specially varying phase shift so that the matter surface can now act as a phase modulator. So, let us take this particular example where the matter surface is basically an array of metallic elements. So, all these elements that you see these are metallic elements. So, the metallic elements the element size and geometry are same along the y direction, but along z direction they are different. Okay? So, that way the phase will be changing along the x direction. right? So, the phases so this is just an example of how you can change phase along one particular direction. So, here you can see the shapes of the elements are engineered such that the phase shift they introduce becomes a linear function like phi equals q x for one of the polarization components. So, here it will becomes a linear function along x. Now, since these uh, matter surfaces are ultra thin they can be modeled as optical components that introduces a specially varying phase shift or you can say phase discontinuity because you know a phase shift 
that takes place over a distance d equals 0 can be thought of as a discontinuity and the thickness of this matter surface is like almost 0. So, you can say that they introduce specially varying phase discontinuities. Now, what is the benefit? By doing phase modulation from these matter surfaces, you can actually modify the incoming optical phase front. Okay? So, like this you have seen, you can use, uh, you know, uh, in the same manner like uh, plane transfer and plates, they may allow the light to simply go through without mod modulating the phase front. But when you take prism, you can actually send it at a particular angle, okay, depending on the prism angle alpha. So, all these functionalities can be achieved. Not only these two, the work of a lens which does the focusing at a particular focal point at a distance f or diffraction grating or graded index plate which also does focusing kind of application. All these components can be literally replaced by matter surfaces. So, the design of the constituent elements need to be changed depending on the application. So, this is what a salutary feature of this approach of using matter surface is that the wave will undergo minimal spatial spread or diffraction as it crosses the infinitesimal small matter surface. So, this is a very good benefit of using matter surface because the thickness is almost 0. So, it will have very minimal diffraction or you can say minimal uh, spatial spreading. So, that is why people are trying to replace all these bulky optical components using this ultra thin matter surfaces. Now, let us look into how this phase modulation works. So, let us consider a phase which is phi x y that can vary li linearly uh, along this matter surface at a rate q. So, q is nothing but the rate of phase change. So, you can write phi equals q x because in this case it is only changing along x direction. So, this is the same matter surface that you have seen before, right. So, it is changing only along x, along y it is same. Now, the complex amplitude of any incoming wave can then be modulated by a factor exponential minus j q x. Okay? So, this is the phase that will be model coming into the picture. So, which is basically a periodic function of the spatial frequency v x that is q over 2 pi. So, this is the spatial frequency of those elements okay, that introduces this phase. So, now look into this figure. So, this figure basically shows a negative reflection and negative refraction at the boundary between the two media of refractive index n 1 and n 2. Okay, when the matter surface is basically present at the interface. Okay. So, here an incoming plane wave of wave vector k 1 which has got an incident angle of theta 1 okay, and it will generate a refracted wave with wave vector k 2, but it is basically a negative refraction. So, instead of going that side, it is basically coming towards on the other side of the normal. So, the angle here is theta 2. Similarly, some part of the incoming wave will be reflected back, but here also we are considering negative reflection. So, k 3 is the reflected wave vector and the angle of reflection is theta 3. So, what has to be done? For this, this wave to exist or this condition to exist, you have to go through the phase matching condition for the incident and refracted waves as well as for the incident and the reflected waves at the matter surface boundary. So, this is the matter surface boundary and you can see that all the wave vectors are drawn here. Okay? So, this is uh, k 3 the reflected one, this is k 2 the refracted one k 1 is the incident one and this is the vector of the um, you know phase change. Okay? And this is n 1 k 0 that is n 2 k 0. Okay? So, now to ensure the phase matching at both sides of the surface 
as we have seen in this figure, what we have to do? We have to look for the component of the vector k2 parallel to the surface. So, that will be basically the sin theta component, right? And that should match the same component of k1, the surface parallel component of k1, that will be again the sin theta component plus that k q vector, okay? And q is basically the vector of magnitude small q that points in positive x direction or in the x direction because it is changing in x, okay? So, you can take it like that. So, if you do that, you can actually put that for the reflected wave, you can do the similar kind of exercise which, which is basically you have to look for the parallel component to the surface that will be the sin theta component, here theta will be key, uh, theta 3 okay? and that should match your k 1 plus q. Okay? So, this way you can actually obtain the conditions and find out the phase matching conditions. So, hence if the matter surface uh, lies at the boundary between the two ordinary medium of refractive indices n1 and n2, its presence can cause the conventional uh, Snell's law of refraction and reflection to assume this particular modified form. So, as I was talking about you know the phase matching, so here you can see what is happening. So, n2 uh, k0 that is basically your uh, k2, okay? the sin component that is sin theta 2. So, that is the component of the refracted wave parallel to this surface that is same as n1 k0 that is nothing but k1 and its parallel component to the surface that is sin theta 1 plus q. Similarly, for the refracted wave you can write n1 k0 that is basically k3 sin theta 3 equals n1 k, k0 that is k1 sin theta 1 plus q. So, this is how you are actually adding this particular factor q in your reflection and reflection equations. So, these are the matter surface refraction and reflection equations. So, these are basically modified Snell's law where you have introduced your particular you know design parameter into this law. So, here we have already discussed theta 1, theta 2, theta 3 are basically the uh, incidence refraction and reflection angles and by appropriate choice of the magnitude and sign of q, okay, you can actually make this work like a negative refractive or ne negative reflection as well as negative refraction kind of surface as we have considered till now. Okay? So, this is how a matter surface is able to get into the Snell's law and allow you that modification of the refraction and reflection characteristics. And as you can see in these equations, when you put q equals 0, that means uh, along the x axis there is no change in the phase that means it's become a normal dielectric material q is 0 this goes back to normal snell's law now you can also write so if you take this uh, k naught on the other side and n2 you can write as nt that is the transmitted one and one you write as ni that is the incident one and um, theta 2 is basically, theta 3 is basically the, you can see here, theta 3 is basically the reflected angle. So, you can write a different notation, something like uh, theta r, okay, and theta i for the incident angle, if you use this kind of notation. So, here you are dividing, so you are taking this term on the left side and taking k naught common and send it on the right side. So, what you have k naught can be written as lambda naught over 2 pi and q that is the rate of phase change can be written as d phi x over dx because only along x your phase is changing. So, this is also another form of this modified equations. Okay? So, here you can see the generalized Snell's law of refraction. So, this is one medium, this is another medium and there is a metasurface that you can see here at the boundary. 
okay so depending on how you are des designing queue you can actually make it work like ordinary surface where you will have ordinary reflection and ordinary refraction or you can choose the amplitude and phase of q in such a way that it can give you anomalous reflection the red line or anomalous refraction this is the red line again okay so it depends on the design of the meta surface whether you can get a ordinary uh, reflection refraction characteristic or some extraordinary thing anomalous means which is not the normal one okay something opposite to the normal one fine so here q as i told you this is basically the gradient of the phase discontinuity along the interface okay and this is where the meta atom design comes into picture so this is given by the meta atoms of the meta surface so this equations also tell you that you know uh, if there is no change this part becomes zero it is a typical snell slope so you can actually make them go in any particular direction depending on whatever is the value here so if you choose a suitable constant gradient for the phase discontinuity along the interface that is whatever you will choose your d phi over dx to be you can make the refracted or the transmitted and the reflected wave to go in any direction okay so you get a complete control on the direction of reflection as well as refraction by introducing this d phi over dx that is the q and that is how matter surface is gaining so much of attention right so for a phase discontinuity phi x that varies slowly with the position x you can say that the derivative may be regarded as a local spatial frequency okay so this quantity also determines the local tilt imparted on a incoming wave and thus you know the angle of reflection and refraction also becomes a function of x so this approach can be clearly uh, seen to be generalized to matter surfaces that introduces a two dimensional phase discontinuity so right now we just saw one example of uh, one dimensional phase discontinuity you can actually make it 2d and uh, that that gives you that phi xy so in that case the q vector will be basically the gradient grad of phi okay and this vector represents the magnitude and the direction of the local spatial frequency of the phase modulation so that will determine which way the reflected and transmitted wave can travel okay so here is the summary of the meta surfaces so we understood that the meta surface can be designed to introduce uh, desired local tilts in the wave front of the incoming wave in both x z and y z planes much like the antenna array or an optical face plate okay so the meta surface can be engineered to introduce position dependent amplitude modulation which can be imparted by the shape of the local elements or the meta atoms and the combination of phase and amplitude modulation can serve as a hologram with complex transmittance that is designed to simulate the wave front of light generated by an object so here are the main understandings of this meta surface so we understood light propagation with phase discontinuities which are basically introduced by meta surfaces now by engineering a phase discontinuity along an interface you are able to fully steer the light wave front and accomplish some unparalleled control of anomalous reflection and refraction which is described by generalized snell's law okay so we'll take some example here so as shown in the figure so you have got a v shape resonator so there are two ways light can fall one is this s that is this particular direction we can call it as a symmetric direction or a that is asymmetric direction so when light falls or the electric field is along um, this s vector 
you can excite symmetric mode on the two branches of this uh, V shape resonator. The angle is 45 degree okay. and um, what you see here is basically the current distribution which is represented by the colors. Okay. So, the blue line shows current distribution for the symmetric case, the red one shows for the asymmetric case and the brighter the color larger is the current and the current uh, flow direction is also shown here okay, through this arrows. Now, in this case what happens you can also you know take mirror image of uh, this particular antennas and they also do similar kind of uh, properties and you can get the components of the scattered electric fields just that they will be pi phase difference from this one. So, just by rotating the antenna you can create a pi phase difference. Okay. So, in the symmetric mode if you look into the current distribution in each arm okay, it approximates that of an individual straight antenna of length h. So, this is length h okay. and therefore, a first order antenna resonance can occur at h equals lambda effective by 2. So, what is lambda effective? That is the effective wavelength. So, in symmetric mode h equals lambda effective by 2. Whereas, when you go for anti-symmetric mode, okay, so anti-symmetric mode this is the direction of the electric field. Okay, it is along this a axis. So, you can see the current distribution is actually okay, in the entire arm. Okay. So, in that case, the total length is 2 h and that is equal to lambda effective by 2. Okay. So, you can also say that the current distribution in each arm approximates that one half of the straight antenna of length 2 h that you can see here. So, here the overall length antenna length is 2 h and the condition is basically 2 h equals lambda by 2. Okay. So, this is how the symmetric and anti-symmetric modes will operate differently. Okay. So, you can also see the analytically calculated amplitude. So, this is basically the amplitude uh, shift and this is the phase shift. So, this is different length or you can say height h of the antenna and these are the different um, delta angle that is basically the opening between the two arms or you can say the angle between the two arms. Okay. So, what we are seeing here? So, analytically it has been calculated what happens to the amplitude and phase shift of this cross polarized scattered light by this V antenna. Now, if they are made of gold rods, so gold rods they are basically having um, cylindrical or circular cross section. So, if you see take the cross section they are basically circle. So, these are rods okay. and their height or length h is varied and the angle is also varied and the wavelength is kept fixed lambda naught equals 8 mm. Okay. So, what happens in this case? So, you see the four circles. Okay. So, these four circles basically show that uh, you are basically changing the angle. Okay between them. So, the optical property of the rod of the same length. So, here you are keeping the length same, but you are changing the angle between them and you are comparing it with a um, flat antenna of the same length. So, you can see how the amplitude as well as the phase changes okay, in these two case. So, here the blue and the dashed curves they correspond to the resonance peaks of the symmetric and anti-symmetric mode. So, symmetric mode is this one sorry this one anti-symmetric mode is this one. So, we are only talking about like uh, this particular case. So, you can only think of the top top case not the bottom one, but then if you look at these four antennas what is happening here you also correspondingly see the phase pattern. So, when they are detuned from the resonance peaks okay, 
as indicated by the circles in C. Here you can see the circles. Okay, you can see that there is an incremental phase shift. This guy is having, you know, 90 degree. Then you have 45 degree. Then you have zero degree, and then you have minus 45 degree. So this is how you know the phase of the cross polarized scattered light is changing you by changing only the you know um, design of the elements. So, uh, if you start opening up these antennas, so this is a V type of antenna and then you start opening them up, you will actually get incremental you know, uh, phase of pi by 4 getting changed from this design to this design. Now, if you do uh, the mirror symmetry, mirror um, structure that is this one and this one, okay, you can actually get additional uh, pi phase shift introduced. So, you actually got many many elements which can give you your desired phase shifts. So, this is evident by observing the currents. So, because they, they too have a completely different current pattern, obviously they are uh, 180 degree out of uh, phase or you can say pi is the phase difference between this one and this one. Okay. So, they if this is giving you 45 degree, this will give you 45 plus pi okay, like that. So, with that people have done, done some experiments with the matter surface. So, this is a set of 8 antennas that has been taken, but you see they are basically 4 antennas and then they are repeated. So, this is how the antennas are taken and then you take this as a unit cell and then you repeat it. So, this is an SEM image of the antenna array which is fabricated on a silicon wafer. The unit cell is basically these ones which are highlighted in yellow. These are all gold V shaped antenna. The width is 220 nanometer and the thickness is 50 nanometer and the repeat period with a periodicity of 11 mm. Okay, So, that is the periodicity in x direction. So, this is x direction horizontal one. So, the periodicity is 11 mm. Okay, The whole thing repeats like that and along this direction along the y direction you have 1.5 micrometer as the periodicity. So, these antennas are designed in such a way that uh, they have equal scattering amplitude. So, each of them will um, scatter the same amplitude, but they will have a constant phase difference of pi by 4 between the neighbors from this one to this one pi by 4 difference from this one to this one pi by 4 difference and so on. So, let us see what is the purpose of doing this. So, if you look into the simulation study. So, this is the 8 antennas that you have seen. Okay, So, they are basically created from these 4 antennas repeated again. So, you can also see that their amplitude is pretty much uh, same just that you know they have a phase that increments as pi by 4. So, this is the silicon substrate on which the antennas are kept. So, this is the point where the antennas are placed hmm. and you can actually see that when um, okay. The, this particular plot shows the scattered electric field which is polarized in the x direction for a y polarized plane wave excitation at the normal incidence from the um, silicon substrate. So, this is the silicon substrate part and it is located below this z equal 0 line. And another important thing to notice here is that the antennas are equally spaced at sub wavelength separation of gamma by 8 where gamma is basically the length of the unit cell. So, the total length is gamma. So, you have equally spaced them okay. and this is how the spacing is 0, gamma by 8, gamma by 4, 3, gamma by 8 and so on. Okay. Now, what happens if you draw the you know phase front, okay, you will see that this particular tilted red straight line shows you the envelope of the projection of the spherical waves that are scattered by these antennas onto the x z plane. Okay? So, that way you are able to see that you are actually able to steer the beam. The beam normally it would have been this black dashed line, but because they are incrementally adding pi by 4 phase 
okay you are able to tilt the beam or steer the beam so that way a very very thin surface can do beam steering okay so that is only one particular application which has caught the attention initial attention of the meta surface or all the scientific community uh, at large there are other applications also like meta surface holography meta surface polarizer meta surface lens sensing cloaking beam steering absorber hyperspectral imaging i believe in the initial lectures when we were talking about the applications of meta surfaces i have discussed all these applications in details now you can go back and revisit that lecture and now you'll be able to make more sense that how meta surface is allowing you to achieve all this now let us look into another important uh, topic which is frequency selected surfaces so when we talk about frequency selective surfaces it is basically a periodic structure with two dimensional arrays of identical elements which are arranged on a dielectric substrate this kind of uh, surfaces when incoming plane wave falls on them they can be either transmitted so that's a pass band or reflected so that gives you a stop band okay um, which can completely block or selectively pass or something like that depending on the nature of the element that you have put in that periodic array okay so something like this so what is the advantage of fss it can be broadband okay you can have uh, rob it can be robust to angle of incidence and most importantly the resonance frequency depends on unit cells shape and size so here you can see this is a frequency selective surface so only the in band frequency is allowed to pass through all the outer out of band frequencies are basically getting reflected so at microwave and optical frequency ranges spatial filtering is most desirable in all signal processing systems and there frequency selective surfaces come into picture because they are called the spatial filters as they are used to modify the em wave incident on such surfaces and then they can provide dispersive transmittive or reflected characteristics now how fss are designed fss are typically designed by periodic metallic arrays of elements placed on a dielectric substrate the change brought to the transmitted waves can be both in amplitude or phase when you uh, compare it with the incident wave and in any case the selectivity may be introduced against the incident polarization to improve the irregularities in the emission pattern which is exhibited through a change of the phase or amplitude of the transmitted wave now there are different applications depending on uh the nature of modification that you have done to the transmitted wave so some examples are you can think of metal grid array so here um the dark line shows the metal okay so these are metal grids here also the dark one shows the metal grids so this is basically a inductive element so you will get a um high pass filter kind of characteristics when you see the transmission coefficient you can also make array of metallic patches so here the dark ones are the metallic patches so dark metallic patches they they behave like capacitive element so you can get low pass characteristics based on this you can also make uh, other shapes something like plus shape metallic plus shape so that actually gives you a band stop characteristics and if you try to make a inverse structure of that that is a complementary structure so you take a metallic sheet and then you make this plus shape holes punch through them you can get the inverse characteristic of this band stop you can get a band pass transmission characteristics so this is what we have seen that uh, typically the fss patches they, they have resistance because you are using metallic elements and they can have inductance or capacitance depending on whatever the elements you are using so when you are using metallic uh, patches you can think of a capacitive element so it can give you uh, low pass characteristics and when you use uh, inductive uh, 
sorry when you use metal grids you can think of uh, this as inductive elements okay and they will give you hyper characteristics okay uh, that is basically the inductive response so using this high pass and low pass you can always think of and you can combine them in series or parallel to make you know band pass or band stop characteristics as you learned already in you know circuit theory so here also something like that can be uh, used to make uh, fss based filters using these concepts so physically when a unit cell of fss is uh, illuminated by electromagnetic wave you can convert that into a effective equivalent resonance circuit right so in the case of metallic patch it is a capacitive element as i mentioned metallic grid is a inductive element but when you try to make a metal square loop array like this okay so the dark one is the metallic uh, loop so it can be modeled as as a l loop and c loop okay so there is gap between the loops that will give you that uh, capacitance effect okay and this uh, loop will give you that inductance okay he, similarly you can also make uh, you know metal square slots so you are actually making slots like this okay so that can give you l slot and c slot in series parallel with another inductance that is coming from this particular uh, grids so that way you can actually make uh, resonating elements okay and the resonance frequency of this kind of loops can be obtained as 1 f equals 1 over 2 pi square root lc so that will tell you where the you know resonance of your band pass or band stop filter will be placed so by choosing appropriate array element you can choose the characteristics of your fss different types of uh, unit cell geometries have been implemented which are very common to the fss community so a, let us classify this you can classify them based on uh, their resonant properties okay so you can also see that there are some elements which are non resonant like patch and wire grid where you only have either capacitance or inductance or you can also have you know single resonator element something like a loop or a cross or a dipole kind of thing which can be modeled as a series combination of inductor and capacitor so this will be resonating element and these are non resonating elements so the classification can be done like this you know the group 1 is basically center connected as you can see these are center connected the length is basically kept as uh, lambda not by 2 okay so this is the overall length as you can see here so here larger elements relative to wavelength now in this one um, the loop type the circumference is basically of the order of lambda not and in the solid type or the plate type as you can see there are different uh, structures designs possible for patch you can have square patch hexagonal patch circular patch and so on so here uh the the length okay or the uh length of this is kept as uh, lambda not by 2 so again the larger elements relative to the wavelength and the group 4 can be combination of uh, any of this uh, elements from the group 1 2 and 3 now what is the main application of uh, fss one important application is towards electromagnetic shielding now electromagnetic interference is a very uh, important factor because it may cause malfunction of any electrical and electronic component in a sensitive environment now it is important to shield the source of uh, interference but that may not be the optimum solution so one of the one of the most common approach is basically to shield the sensitive device okay and typically what people do they apply a metal foil that can be employed as a uh, electromagnetic shield to protect the um, rf circuitry from the radiated fields although this technology has some disadvantage because it blocks all kind of transmissions irrespective of the origin now that you may not like okay so in that case you know uh, fss may actually help you from 
getting rid of this kind of problems. So, if you design a 2D single layer FSS, they will definitely have clear advantages because they will they will be easy to fabricate and they can only block or emit a selective frequency. They will not shield all the frequencies. Okay. So those are the application scenarios. So here is a design layout of an FSS. As you can see, these are the different uh, structural parameters. This is the period uh, uh, that is periodic arrangement. Okay, this is the overall 3D view of the unit cell, and this is the slide side view of the unit cell. So this is basically uh, FSS made of copper on a dielectric substrate, and it is Rogers 5880 substrate, which has got a thickness of 0.127 mm, permittivity of 2.2, and dielectric loss tangent is given here. And this is the overall dimension of the unit cell 6.8 by 6.8 uh, millimeter square. Okay, and uh, dx is the parameter that gives you inter element spacing. So, what I am showing here is a design of a FSS and how what will be the response for that. So, we are putting this parameter p okay on the rectangular lattice that tells you about the periodicity in of the proposed unit cell in this fabricated FSS. Then um, you want a resonating frequency at 10 gigahertz. So you actually optimized all these physical parameters L, G, W, R, D, X and P all are these physical parameters. These are the range over which they are optimized and these are the basically the optimized dimensions of the FSS that has been obtained. Once you optimized you have fabricated the FSS and this is how the fabricated FSS looks like. So this is how you can create a measurement setup. So, you can put two horn antennas operating with operating bandwidth of say 8 to 12 gigahertz for measuring the transmission characteristics. There the antennas are connected to a network analyzer and you can actually uh, measure the transmission uh, characteristics by placing a FSS between these two horn antennas. Okay? And what you will see you can measure the S11 and S21 parameter. So, this is the plot of the dark line shows the transmission characteristics and the dotted line shows you the S11. So, here you can see for the 10 gigahertz, okay, it is giving you a very effective shielding of almost 56 dB. It is minus 56 dB here, you see. So, it can block, you know, 10 gigahertz frequency up to 56 dB. So, that is very, very good shielding and it will not actually block other frequencies. So, this is very, very good uh, electromagnetic shield, this FSS at 10 gigahertz. Okay? So, because of the design symmetry along X and Y, you can say that this FSS will give uh, identical response in both TE and TM incidences. So, that makes this a very, very useful one. So, here are the other potential applications. You can think of absorbers, you can think of uh, filter plus antenna. So, here you have receiver antenna, you can have a band pulse structure made of FSS and then you have a transmitter antenna. You can also have absorber plus filter where you can have a resistive FSS here which can absorb. You can have a pass band um, metallic FSS here and in between there is a spacer. So, these two combined can give you something between transmission or absorption. So, you are switching between transmission and absorption okay, and you are keeping the reflection more or less flat. Okay. You can also have tunable absorbers. So, based on this FSS where you can also include some of the uh, this one um, liquid crystals. So, I will not go into details of this, but these are different different applications apart from, from uh, shielding. You can have absorber, filter plus antenna, absorber plus filter and all these things made out of FSS. So, with that we will um, stop here today and in the next lecture we will consider um, guided mode resonance. So, regarding this lecture if you have got any query you can always drop an email to me at this address mentioning MOOC on the subject line. Thank you. Thank you.